My mother-in-law said she wants my son to marry someone else. She thinks you're too old for him because you can't have kids, my mother-in-law said, smiling at a younger woman next to her. My husband, sitting silently beside her, didn't say anything. Feeling upset, I stormed out of the room. But soon after, I regretted it and wanted to make things right. I feel really bad about marrying into this family. My name's Olivia, and I'm 38 years old. I met my husband, Sam, who's eight years younger, through a friend. I was unsure about dating him because of our age gap, but he insisted that age doesn't matter. I love you, Olivia, he said, and we started dating. Eventually, we got married after six months. When Sam introduced me to his parents, his mother didn't like me because of our age difference. When you said you were bringing a woman to consider marrying, I thought she'd be young and cute. 38 years old, Sam. I mean, no offense, but think about it again. Younger women are usually better, she told Sam right in front of me. My father-in-law intervened, saying, If Sam thinks she's good, then she's good, right? Sorry for my wife's rude comments, Olivia. Eventually, we got their approval for our marriage. My father-in-law was good at smoothing over my mother-in-law's harsh words, making it seem like he didn't want any conflict. But after we got married, he often ignored issues, which was disappointing. Sam's family was well known as landowners in our small town, and my mother-in-law loved to brag about it. Even though she wasn't technically related by blood, she married into the family, just like me. This family is very wealthy, and Sam, being the favorite, has a charming and dreamy aura. My previous partner was very careful with money, which was tough. So Sam's relaxed and generous attitude towards money is quite attractive to me. Even though my mother-in-law reluctantly accepted our marriage after my father-in-law scolded her, she doesn't seem happy about it. She keeps telling me how a good wife should act, which is frustrating. She's influential among the local women and takes pride in leading the women's association and being popular. She insisted I take time off during the week to meet the association members. She believes it's important to impress them. She introduced me proudly, but some of them hinted that she might not be as well-liked as she thinks. Oh, and she also told me to get a medical checkup to see if I could have children. I was a bit put off that it was her, not Sam, who ordered it but I was also curious to know if I could get pregnant, so I agreed. Gynecological exams aren't exactly a walk in the park. Despite being important for women's health, they're uncomfortable. Does anyone else find sitting in that examination chair waiting unbearable? Despite the discomfort, my bridal health check results were good. I felt relieved when the doctor said, You're healthy. Sam seemed worried, but he looked relieved when I told him the news. I shared the results with my mother-in-law, hoping we could finally celebrate our marriage happily. But then she said, good that you've passed the first hurdle. The first hurdle? What does she mean by that? I thought she'd be happier. Was she secretly hoping for bad news? As I tried to figure out how to respond, my mother-in-law surprised me with a proposal. After you get married, let's build a duplex and live together. You'll split the down payment and mortgage. You work in administration, right? Your salary might not be high, but you should be able to handle it at your age. A duplex? Living together? Splitting the costs with me? I felt overwhelmed by this sudden flood of suggestions. I looked at my husband sitting beside me, hoping for some support, but he remained silent. Could you please chime in? I asked him. Um, I haven't discussed anything about living together with Sam. And... Well, before we talk about a duplex and living arrangements, I'd like to address the comment about my job, I said, feeling a bit hurt. You have to discuss it. Oh, well, Sam probably thought it was understood. That's not good. We've always planned that when Sam gets married, we'll all share a house and live together, my mother-in-law insisted. I felt a chill run down my spine. Always? Is she implying she drilled this idea into Sam's head by repeating it constantly? That's correct. That's what I had in mind. Wait, you didn't know about this? Why are you agreeing so easily? My mother-in-law questioned. I'm sorry, but I had no idea about this plan, 
and I can't make a decision without discussing it with Sam first. Can we please hold off on this for now? I said before leaving my in-law's house. Later, when I talked to Sam, he admitted that after we got married, he intended to build a duplex on his parents' property and live with them. I was furious that Sam hadn't told me about his plans, but when he apologized and said he forgot, I couldn't stay mad. I thought I might not find someone as kind and handsome as Sam at my age, so I ignored the warning signs and went ahead with the marriage. Looking back, I realized I should have been more cautious. I ended up going along with my mother-in-law's wishes and helped pay for a duplex where we'd live with Sam's parents. Six months into our marriage, I found out I was pregnant. I kept it a secret from my in-laws until I was sure everything was stable. When I finally told them, they were thrilled and started discussing baby names, assuming it would be a boy, although we didn't know the gender yet. Despite feeling pressure, it's nice to see them happy. I was advised to quit my job for safety reasons, but since I help with my family's business, I have some flexibility. I decided to keep working as long as it doesn't strain me too much. My pregnancy was going smoothly, and I started feeling the baby's movements, a long-awaited joy. It's a mysterious yet happy feeling to sense a tiny life stirring inside me. I'm grateful for the joy of being a woman and experiencing this miracle. Sam, my husband, and my in-laws eagerly anticipate the baby's growth at each checkup, and I can't wait for the child's birth. I have a feeling that my relationship with my mother-in-law will improve once the baby arrives. One day, when everything seemed perfect, I noticed the baby's movements were weakening. I felt an indescribable anxiety and rushed to the hospital. The doctors gave me heartbreaking news. Something was wrong with the baby. Why? How? I was living normally. What did I do wrong? I was gripped with fear over the risks. I was hospitalized immediately. But despite the doctor's efforts, my child passed away. Just a few more months and I could have held my baby. Why did this happen so suddenly? It felt like just yesterday when the baby was moving so energetically inside me. Was it my fault? As I cried in sorrow, my husband's words pierced through my pain. How long will you cry? It's over now, isn't it? Crying won't bring the baby back. Stop crying. I was stunned. What was Sam saying? Our child had just passed away. Even though I was taken aback by this cold side of Sam I had never seen before, my shattered state of mind left me unable to speak. Then came the day I was discharged from the hospital. Sam didn't come to pick me up. I managed to force a smile and reassure the nurses who were concerned about me going home alone. When I arrived home in a taxi, Sam, my mother-in-law, and an unfamiliar woman greeted me. Welcome back. It's a shame, isn't it? said my mother-in-law with a strange smile. Yes, I responded, taking a seat on the living room couch as suggested. The seating arrangement was strange, with my mother-in-law and the woman sitting across from me on a bench, and Sam sitting next to them, showing no effort to comfort me or make eye contact. As my mother-in-law spoke, my heart sank. We've talked it over with Sam. Since you can't have children anymore, we don't see the point in keeping you as our daughter-in-law. We're thinking of having this other girl marry Sam instead. Hearing those words while still reeling from the shock of losing my baby, tears filled my eyes. But I refused to let myself break down. I had to stay strong, telling myself that crying would mean giving up. I kept my head down, unable to look up. Ignoring my distress, my mother-in-law continued heartlessly. If you're willing to work and support our family instead of having children, we might consider letting you stay. What do you think? Can I count on you to take care of us if they leave me behind? Confusion and disbelief washed over me. Without thinking, I looked at my husband for support. But when our eyes met, Sam quickly looked away. Beside him, a woman who seemed triumphant stared back at me. I remembered her as Sam's childhood friend, introduced to me at our wedding. Seeing that my husband wouldn't even meet my gaze, I realized he's not on my side. He won't help me. A chill ran down my spine, and strangely, my mind became clear. They must have discussed this during my hospitalization. They planned to replace me, the woman who can't have children, with a younger wife who can bear in hair. 
If I stay here, I'll only suffer. There's nothing for me here anymore. With newfound clarity, I address Sam. I understand where you stand. Let's get a divorce. Please, go and live happily with your new wife. Leaving the house, I return to my family home. My parents, surprised but warmly welcoming, were already aware of my miscarriage. They were outraged by the cruelty I have faced so soon after leaving the hospital. Their warm reaction was a relief after everything, and I ended up crying a lot that day. Exhausted from tears, I fell asleep. However, the next day, my mother-in-law and husband, who had shown such cruelty in driving me out, unexpectedly showed up at my family home. At first, my mother dealt with them normally, but once she realized who they were, she refused to engage with them. Then, they started incessantly ringing the doorbell, shouting, We've canceled the divorce. Come back now. You see, my family runs a barbecue restaurant, a well-known spot that serves a globally famous brand of beer. It's frequented by many celebrities and athletes who enjoy our delicious food. However, my husband's family comes from an old, respected background, and they look down on our family, thinking that running a restaurant was somehow shady. They had this outdated belief that restaurant businesses were inferior, and they saw our family as less well-off. We even invited them to dine with us once before the marriage, but they declined, saying, beef. We always eat at certain places. Eating meat from other restaurants gives me heartburn. Sorry. During the pre-wedding meetings, they indirectly belittled my family with remarks like, Oh, you run a restaurant, right? That's so old-fashioned. Oh, I see, from your parents' generation. Hmm, dealing with beef, huh? Well, respectable families don't engage in such businesses. It hurt to see my parents, who had worked hard to raise me, being treated this way. But they brushed it off with a laugh, saying there are always people with narrow mindsets. On the day I left after the divorce, my husband and mother-in-law happened to see our restaurant being featured on TV. Up until then, they had shown no interest and considered my family beneath them. But they panicked when they saw the restaurant described as running its own farm that produces top-quality beef enjoying extreme popularity with meat exported worldwide, being highly successful and lucrative. Suddenly, they tried to cozy up to me, saying, If your family were wealthy, we wouldn't have talked about divorce. We're sorry for yesterday. We weren't thinking clearly. Please come back. After all their talk about children and hares, was it really all about money in the end? My husband Sam and his family never asked much about my job, so I had simply told them I worked in office administration for my family's company, leading them to believe I was a low-paid and incompetent employee. Consequently, they probably assumed that asking me to pay for the house would make me give up on the marriage. In reality, I managed the meat export division of my parents' company, earning a substantial income for an office worker. Fortunately, I had saved up a good amount due to getting married later in life allowing me to provide the money they demanded. I am also a major shareholder in the company and aspire to eventually take over my father's position to further expand the business. Despite this, they had never shown any interest or asked me about my role until it was highlighted on TV, leading to an overnight change in their treatment of me. Despite incessantly talking about wanting children, it became apparent that money was their primary concern. Their shallowness appalled me. Finally, my father, who had been silently observing the situation, lost his temper and kicked Sam and his parents out. Thank you, Dad. You saved me, I said. My father, still seething with anger, began drinking and cursing at them. He had me explain everything from before the marriage without holding back any details, believing I couldn't handle this alone. My father promptly contacted a lawyer he knew, leading to a demand for damages since I was unjustly evicted. We also asked for reimbursement for the housing funds I had provided during our cohabitation. The claim was acknowledged, and it was decided that I would receive a refund for the expenses I covered. However, Sam alone couldn't repay the loan I had taken out, so his family home had to be sold. They had built a lavish house on rural property just for show, leaving a considerable mortgage remaining even after the sale. Moreover, the house was filled with the eccentricities of Sam's mother, 
making finding a buyer willing to accept it as is doubtful, suggesting that disposal could take time. Fortunately, they managed to sell some land they owned separately, allowing me to recoup my money first, which was a relief. At this point, I was grateful for marrying into a landlord's family. Sam and his parents were forced to leave their beloved two-family home and now seem to be struggling in a rented apartment, facing difficulty repaying their loan. As for the woman who was planning to marry Sam, she was only interested because she thought she'd live in a big house and that his family was wealthy. But as soon as she found out they were going to lose the house and still be in debt, she disappeared. It was probably the best decision for her because if she had married him, she might have been pressured to have a child and forced to work due to her young age. News travels fast in this rural area. Gossip spreads like wildfire, especially when it involves a well-known family like Sam's. People are buzzing with interest, commenting on how poorly they treated me and how they used to flaunt their big house but are now in debt and living in an apartment. With both the wife and potential new wife gone, their family line might end with this generation. It's incredible how accurate the rumors are and makes you wonder who's been watching all this. The power of a rural network is quite something. Now my bossy mother-in-law, who used to act like she owned the place, sneaks around even when shopping, worried about people's stares. My parents remind me, we warned you not to marry into a family that would insist on testing if you could get pregnant before marriage, didn't we? And brush off the situation. They even console me in their own way, saying, Olivia just rushed into marriage a bit. Don't worry about it. It's fine if you stay home. They try to be understanding in their own way. Despite the troubles of being kicked out and going to court, I can see they're happy to have their daughter back home. I'm grateful for their warmth. It feels like I was just dreaming or living a nightmare during my married life. But now I'm free. I may have a divorce behind me, but I'm still in my 30s. I haven't given up on marriage. Once things settle down, I plan to work hard to find a new partner. But for now, maybe I'll focus on doing good things for my parents.